We are in the Feast of the Transfiguration or Transfiguration Sunday. It is the feast that is observed just before Ash Wednesday, which is this Wednesday. Uh, Transfiguration Sunday is a Sunday that anticipates the season of Lent, a season when Christians prepare themselves for the events of Holy Week and Jesus' death. Now, while it may seem strange to be thinking about Jesus' glorification before his passion, there is a good reason why this feast is put here in the calendar of the church, in the lectionary. Uh, for one thing, the story in the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, took place before Jesus' passion. And for another, the feast is put before Jesus' passion to help us wake up from our sleep. Before we enter into a time of repentance and renunciation during Lent, we need to first wake up, wake up from our slumber. I've been telling you over and over that the purpose of reading scripture is to encounter Jesus, nothing else, right? And I've also been telling you that the purpose of reading the scripture through the lectionary is to follow along the story of Jesus. And the reason we want to follow the story of Jesus is so that we have an encounter with him, the word of God made flesh. And so the feast is put before Jesus' passion because it invites us to wipe the sleep from our eyes, to be able to see what we are and become what we see. The transfiguration of Christ shows us who we are. It reveals our origin, our purpose, and the end to which we must aim. You and I look at ourselves in the mirror all the time, right? Mirrors show our external appearances. The transfiguration, on the other hand, shows the archetypal beauty within creation and humanity. The prototype, basically that's what archetypal means. The prototype of what we were created for. This means that the transfiguration is not just an event in history. Instead, it is a condition or a way of being. The transfiguration reveals a present reality. The transfiguration is already within us and the world. The glorified and transfigured Christ is the prototype of our own creation, of our own creation recreated in Him. Now, the reading for us this year, year C, is quite unique, quite different from the other two years on year A and year B, we read the Gospel of Matthew and Mark respectively, and the narrative only includes the event of the Transfiguration, the narrative that is included in the lectionary reading. The lectionary selection for this year, year C, includes a story that comes right after the Transfiguration, the story of Jesus healing a demon-possessed boy. Why? Well, we'll find out shortly. So the text for us this morning is Luke chapter 9, verses 28 to 43a. Let me read it for you. Now, about eight days after these sayings, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed, and his clothes become, became dazzling white. Suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish in Jerusalem. Now Peter and his, his companions were weighed down with sleep, but since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Just as they were leaving, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah not knowing what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone, and they kept silent, and in those days told no one any of the things they had seen. 
On the next day, when they had come down from the mountain, a great crowd met him. Just then, a man from the crowd shouted, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son. He's my only child. And suddenly a spirit seizes him, and all at once he shrieks. It convulses him until he foams at the mouth. It mauls him and will scarcely leave him. I beg your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. Jesus answered, you faithless and perverse generation, how much longer must I be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here. While he was coming, the demon dashed him to the ground in convulsions, but Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, healed the boy, and gave him back to his father. And all were astounded at the greatness of God. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that the story of the transfiguration of your son is a prototype of who we were made to be. And of course, Lord, something that we should aim for in our lives, even right here and right now while we're still on this earth. And so help us, Lord, to experience an encounter with Jesus and help us to be transfigured even in the midst of our brokenness and disfigurement so that we are completely healed. And just like the Lord Jesus, we also become transfigured, not for our glory, but for His praise. In His name we pray and give thanks. Amen. Amen. Let me ask you a question. When have you recently experienced beauty? What are some of the most beautiful experiences that you've had? Before you answer, let me explain what I'm asking. I'm not asking when you saw something you thought was beautiful. I'm not talking about physical beauty, which is the outward appearance of people or things, or the appearance which we see in the mirror. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm asking about moments in situations in which you experienced and participated in beauty. Not so much with your eyes, not so much with your mind, but with your heart. I'm talking about those times when the beautiful meets us and we know it intimately. Not as an object, but as a presence greater than ourselves. We are grasped and enfolded by the beauty and it shapes and forms our lives, leaving us forever changed. The beauty I'm speaking of cannot be defined. It can only be encountered and experienced. And such beauty is more than what our words can describe, but is often named by our tears. And I'm sure you've had all, you've all had those times when beauty of the moment just fills your eyes with tears. And all you can say is, it's just so beautiful, right? And if you want to recall, you will agree that this is happening actually all the time. These stories of beauty are my stories and your stories. We all have them. We're always waking up to the presence of beauty in ourselves, in each other, and the world. Now, before you think this is narcissistic, it is not. Because how could it be otherwise? when one of the divine names, one of the names for God, is the beautiful one. Sixth century Dionysius the Aeropagite declared beauty to be the name of God. And so did the 13th century theologian Thomas Aquinas. And so if the church had understood that one of the divine names is the beautiful one, why wouldn't the beautiful one make himself known through and regularly invites us to participate in beauty, right? At the beginning of scripture, Genesis tells us that the creator looked at all creation and declared it to be very good. Now, did you know that the Hebrew word translated for good also means beautiful? What does it say about us then? 
that we have been created in the image and the likeness of the beautiful one. Here's what I think all this means. We have been created with an eye for beauty. We are to live with an eye for beauty. We are to see ourselves and one another with an eye for beauty. An eye for beauty opens us to the transfiguring presence of God in every human being. The transfiguring presence of God in our lives and in our world. Beauty connects us to the truest and most authentic self, and it is available to all who keep awake. And so ask yourself, what are your stories of beauty? What have you known and participated in that presence that can only be described as beautiful? Bring to your mind what happened, where you were, who was there, when has the beauty of worship, for example, a piece of music, a piece of art, poetry, a conversation brought tears to your eyes. Recall a time when beauty wrapped itself around you and all you could think was, I never want this moment to end. The experience of beauty ranges from the most profound and intimate experiences to those fits of holy laughter that leave you with a belly ache and streams of tears. <laughs> what are your experiences of beauty? Where have you encountered beauty this past week? Whatever your encounters are, they're actually an encounter with the divine presence. Experiences of the light of God, the light of God that illumines your life, experiences through which your life was transformed and forever changed. They are your experiences of transfiguration, moments and situations in which you had an eye for beauty. <laughs> Isn't that what happened to Peter, John, and James? They were sleepy, but they kept awake. And they saw Christ's glory. They had an eye for beauty. They awoke to the beauty that had always been before them. The beauty wasn't new, but their seeing was. Now, here's what's interesting about our text. Luke doesn't offer any explanation or speculation about how this happened. Only that it did happen. There's no Jesus telling them to tell no one about the vision until after the Son of Man had been raised from the dead, like we find in the other two synoptic Gospels. Neither do Peter and John and James offer an explanation or ask the question to Jesus, why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first, like what we have in Matthew and Mark? The only thing we are told is that at the end of verse 36, after they heard the voice from the cloud, they kept silent. Peter, John, and James kept silent and told no one of any of the things they had seen. Now, I think there's some wisdom for us in the silence of Peter, John, and James. The transfiguration is one of those stories, one of those big stories, one of those mountaintop stories that can begin to seem a bit too fantastic, a bit too unreal, and even distant from us, right? And, and often we take those kinds of stories and either look for some rational explanation, or we make it a supernatural event about Jesus that could never happen in our mundane lives in a valley. Either way, we close our eyes and we fall asleep. We fall asleep to the beauty of God that is in us and all around us. Their silence, however, asks us to just let the story be the story. It doesn't need to be explained. Instead, it needs to be experienced. It doesn't need to be understood. Instead, it needs to be lived. When we let the story be the story, then we can create room for it to become our story. We let it live in us. And the story of the transfiguration in today's gospel is the story of the sublime, the absolute beauty. While Luke does not explain the transfiguration, neither he let us be naive about it. 
I think that's why in his account of the gospel, the story of the demon-possessed boy immediately follows the story of the transfiguration. A story, although included in the Matthew and Mark version, but not included in the lectionary selection for year A and year B. And here's, I think, the reason why. Luke is holding before us a truth and a reality about the world and ourselves. Transfiguration and disfiguration stand side by side. Reality and truth. Transfiguration, disfiguration, they stand side by side. And they do in each one of us in our world, just like in Luke's gospel. It says, on the next day when they had come down from a mountain, a man brought his demon-possessed son to Jesus. He told Jesus that the demon mauls his son, and the boy shrieks, convulses, foams at the mouth. It is not a pretty scene. In fact, it's an ugly scene. See, the boy's life had been distorted. The boy's life is disfigured. He has been separated from the original beauty of his creation. He has been detached from his truest and most authentic self. He's not himself. It's a story of disfiguration. And even if we do not necessarily experience the disfiguration that this boy experienced, oh, we've known times like that as well, right? There are those times when we look at ourselves in the mirror in our life, and we don't like what we see or what we have become. It's not a pretty sight. It's ugly. I'm not talking about our outward or physical appearance. We can fake that. This ugliness, like beauty, is a condition of the heart. It is an internal condition. And in those times, we are recognizing that our life has become deformed and disfigured. We might even say things like, I'm just not myself. What happened there, that's not me. How did my life get to this point? I don't know what came over me. That's not who I am. How many times you've catch yourself saying that? Oh, <laughs> guilty. What we're really saying is that we've lost the connection with the original beauty of our creation. We've fallen asleep to the beauty within us the beauty within others, and the world. But here's the good news. The beauty has not and cannot be lost. The beauty has not and cannot be lost. It doesn't matter who you are, what you've done, or what your life is like. The beauty cannot be lost. Human life and the world have already been transfigured. That's what Jesus knows and demonstrates with his healing of the boy. You see, Jesus always sees with an eye for beauty. He, he, refused to, he refuses to let the manifestation of ugliness turn him away. Even within the distorted and disfigured life of the boy, Jesus sees beauty in him. He calls forth and open himself to the boy's beauty he knows has always been there. Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, healed the boy, and gave him back to his father. That's the power of beauty to change our lives, my friend, and to return us to ourselves. That's the beautiful one in the flesh, healing, restoring, and making whole. That's the transfiguration in the mundane of our life. Now, more often than not, however, we turn away from the ugly and are either unwilling or unable to trust the beauty within the distortion, the beauty within the disfigurement. Like what Paul said in our epistle reading, we harden our minds. And because of that, there is a veil over our minds. I suspect that's why the disciples could not heal the boy. They're turning away from the ugly and unwillingness to trust the beauty within the distortions, harden their minds, and puts a veil 
over it. But absolute beauty is everywhere. It is in the transfigurations and disfigurations of life. On the mountaintops and in the valleys. In you and in me. And in those we never would have guessed or thought possible. And so I don't want to miss out beauty. And I don't think you do either. I want to be able to look in the mirror before I go to bed and see beauty. I want to wrap my arms around all of us and stand together in beauty. As we enter the season of Lent next week, I want to recognize even more the beauty that is contained in the cross. The ultimate display of disfigurement transfigured. Why? Because I want to be able to look at the disfigured, broken, and hurting places of our lives, of our world, trusting that beauty is present. And so let's live and see with an eye for beauty. And as Paul said, since it is by God's mercy that we are engaged in this ministry, we do not lose heart. Even in the most disheartening times, we do not lose heart. We do not lose heart because Christ is Lord of the church. We do not lose heart because our ministry is to notice and proclaim God's given beauty in Christ and to invite people to walk with us into the God-given beauty in Christ. May our lives... May our disfigured lives be transfigured today so that we can also notice transfigurement in the disfigured. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for giving us the story of the transfiguration, which if we think about the reflection that we just meditate upon this morning, The transfiguration is a story about grace. Grace that enables to transfigure our disfigurement. And grace that enables us to see disfigurement all around us being transfigured because of the beauty that is within. Help us, Lord, to have the eye for beauty. And help us to walk forward following you on the way to your suffering, Lord Jesus, with this attitude. And with that, you will find ourselves faithful to you. In your name we pray and give thanks. Amen. Amen.